Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Tanya Anderson. I'll be moderating today. Before we get start, um, we're going to just be having one of the presentations today instead of two. So we're going to be um, having a presentation titled What Can Be Done to Address the High Rates of Injury and Trauma um, by Professor Charles Brannis. So I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce Professor Brannis. So, Professor Brannis is the chair of the Immunology of the Maryland School of Public Health at Columbia University and an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine in the American Immunology Society. Um, in addition to his pioneer research in healthcare access and home space interventions regarding gun violence, Professor Brannis has led many multinational efforts aimed at developing health, health metrics <clears throat> while simultaneously generating voters of science missing. Through his national and international teaching and training programs, Professor Brannis is the Columbia co director with Professor Golden and the University of Ghana director, Dr. Rita Golden. Uh, with Columbia University, University of Guyana Research and Injury and Trauma Training Program, a sister uh, center of CCIS. So, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, thanks for coming and joining. I see some folks I've met around the room, so I'm, I'm eager to tell you a little bit more. Um, I know that uh, Dr. DeGutis will not be joining us, but uh, perhaps I can even touch a little bit on what uh she was going to say uh maybe we even finish her but i wanted to make this um a little more interactive was my hope since it's a relatively small group for you so rather than just focus on the slide let me start by saying what do you all think injury and trauma is what what are the, some of the things that define it Something that causes pain or um, long term discomfort. Okay, really, I love the long term inclusion because many people don't imagine that as part of what they think about when they say injury and trauma. Yeah. But I, I think also it goes beyond the physical. Okay. So, um, especially. The acid conference that comes through like an injury and pain, it can go beyond what happens to your heart and physical. So, so psychologically as well and mentally, we've been talking about in this conference about that. And uh, that is part of the definition. But to be very honest with you, that, that has only been inserted in the past decade. So uh, for decades and decades, the definition of injury revolved around so a couple key points revolved around physical injury, but now to also include psychological injury. And some of the other key markers of injury, it is, we think of it as a disease, right? So it could be like having a heart attack or getting lung cancer. The difference is that the disease happens in a fraction of a second. You are in a car crash. You are mostly, you are, let's say you're completely healthy. You are suddenly, you get this disease in a fraction of a second. You are shot with a firearm. That disease happens to you in a fraction of a second. So in that respect, it is an acute disease, but the long-term consequences persist. And people don't think about that. So, we're, so I'm going to try to talk to you a little today about not just simply recognizing it's, it's a disease that happens, it happens in a fraction of a second, but that um, we need to think more about just treating it at that moment. Of course, that is incredibly important. We need to think about the long-term strategy of what to do to prevent it. Um, and by the way, in terms of preventing it from happening in the first place, because there's very little you can do in a fraction of a second. Um, it's best to try to stop it from happening at, at all. Yep. So the other key aspect of things that we think of as injury, and I'm giving you the, sort of the definitions of what the organization has, is that it comes from the outside. So it's not something that, uh, it's not like uh, cancer that accumulates in your body over decades 
uh, and the cancer or the, the tumor gets produced. It's something from the outside, an external force. And so it's not a biologic force oftentimes, it's a physical force, right? So a bullet, uh, a car crash, falling, these are uh, major issues. Consuming pesticide. Yeah, these are external things that come upon you um, that can uh, produce challenge. Now, as part of that, the folks who are mostly, not entirely, but disproportionately affected are the basically what I would call the flower of our generation, our youngest people. Injury is the number one cause of death in the first half of the human lifespan. Um, so it's very, very important. We're not simply investing in the last half of, of, of human life. We are talking about our children and our youth that are at greatest risk here. Um, and it, it is around the world. You can go to the next slide. You can see where this is a slide is told, but still the truth is that, you can go back one. Yeah. So injury is the major cause of disability adjusted life years. That is, it's going to generate more disability that's going to persist for the rest of your life than anything else around the world. Motor vehicle crashes, car crashes, suicide, homicide. These things generate more challenge uh, for survivors and the disabilities that come out. And I want to also say, and I'm not going to go into this, but those challenges, when that fraction of a second event happens, it is not simply the person who experienced it. Who else? Their families, their friends, their neighbors. Uh, I, I work often in US cities, especially in the city of Philadelphia. When someone is shot on a block in Philadelphia, it is not simply that person, it is their family. But then people are so fearful, they will move, sometimes leave the country when they can. They are so scared by that. The, the economic repercussions and the repercussions of an, of an event like this are enormous. Okay. And that's a major, the major part that, you know, think about the economic consequences because one has to address both the acute and the long term consequences of injuries and they have a huge economic burden. Yes. And especially as you have there the demarcation. Well, sorry, not. No, no, no interrupt me. Do it. Yeah. Um, as you had in, 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 in your previous slide that. Is a major disease in low income and lower middle income countries that can still afford the economic uh, uh, consequences, especially in terms of the values here. This is like, yeah. So, if you look at um, longevity and, and uh, lifespan in developing nations, the reason that it is perhaps a decade or more or less than, than developed nations is because of the injury challenge. That those nations face. That's because it's primarily a disease of the young. So if you're talking 15 to 24 year olds are passing away because of this, that's going to take away dramatically, or worse, or not worse, but equally challenging is if those 15 to 24 year olds have accumulated disability from that single event for the rest of their lives. So it, exactly. So it's a health challenge, it's also a major economic challenge to, to nations. And I, I shouldn't, I, I put the building nations up there because it is true, but it's to the extent you would want to call the United States a developed nation, it is a major problem for us, you know, the top problem. Okay. In fact, our, our fire and violence issue in the U.S., I'm not going to dwell on this, but it's the number one killer of our children now. So it is a huge challenge for us as well. All right, but, but to what to do, right? And I think many places I go, um, there is the notion that these are accidents. Now, I'm not gonna to try to take the word out of your vocabulary, um, uh, as colleagues of mine have tried to do over the decades. People will still use the word accident, but I want you to understand the implication of saying accident means that, um, so in the Middle East, they say it was written. Uh, and that is that there's nothing we could have done. That person was going to die that you see before you and there's absolutely nothing we can do we can do is simply an accident and i want to tell you scientifically that that is absolutely not the case um, there are great opportunities to prevent these debilitating events and to prevent them from happening in the first place one of the bits of research that we did is we compared uh, injury prevention for instance um, child safety seats in cars and putting seat belts on 
um, to vaccines for children. And in fact, putting children, it's like vaccinating your child in the, while driving, putting them in the child seats. And the return on those investments of those vaccinations on the roadways are more than actual vaccines for children. Now, all they're all great, but, it, but there's great opportunity here to have actual impact. And then I will offer some thought, an organized medical system can save lives. You have what's called the golden hour after you're severely injured, about a one hour period. If you can or organize your medical system, there's a lot of people. You can reduce 25% of those lost lives with an organized medical system. So I, I'm not going to fully touch on that today. I'm going to talk more about what we call primary prevention, preventing it from happening in the first place. But I want to uh, give uh, a nod to the importance of, the, of a, a well-organized medical and trauma care system. Okay. Um, so how many of, do any of you, I can't remember, I think it's on Netflix. Do you, have, do you watch Netflix at all here? I'm learning. You do. Does anyone watch The Crown? Do you know what I'm talking about? I saw, I saw it, but I never watched it. I it. <laughs> well, anyways, no, I don't want to bring the UK into this, uh, but I'm going to in this example because I like the example. And if you watch The Crown, you'll get to see so the background of that led to all the challenges that Princess Diana had. Now, does everyone remember when she died? I mean, some of you are too young to remember that, but you know that she died. Because it's not far off of my birth. Oh, I didn't remember the date. You can tell us more about the date. Maybe that'll date it. Okay. Was it seven? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. I can't remember because I always, I, I, 97 or 96, maybe if someone has a phone, they could Google while we're standing here. But what I, what I do remember is it's a long time to uh, get to her. Yeah. Yeah. So wait, so let me let me let me preempt that by asking you. There are five things in the in her death, if you all recall back to it, that could have saved her life. Injury prevention opportunities and solutions that could have saved the princess's life that did not happen. What were they? Those I'll let you... seat belts. One of the things that the research came out of the white square seat belts. It was speed in. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm, I'm going to only give you one. Each, each, each person gets what? So, so wait, let me just let me... He did a study on it. Uh, so the seat belt, but one person survived. Yeah, yeah. he was wearing the exactly the only person wearing the seatbelt in that car survived in the passenger side, right? Yeah. So, so that's one thing, seatbelts. So, number two, she named, she named one another one. So, I won't go that way. Apparently, the driver was also driving under the influence. Ah, and so the driver was driving under the influence because they had just come from a party in a hotel in Paris, by the way, right? Yeah. So alcohol, I don't, someone raised alcohol in the last session I was in. I'm not gonna talk about alcohol, but if you wanna talk about alcohol and its involvement with injury prevention, we can have an entire session on that. We think of alcohol, it's like a fire is burning, which is the injury and the probability of, of that injury. Alcohol is like throwing petrol on that fire. Okay, so it basically, it is often the cause, and perhaps over half of these events I'm telling you about, whether it be car crashes, whether it be falls, whether it be violence, and by the way, also suicide, alcohol is involved in these events. So to the extent you can manage your alcohol policy in a way that just doesn't simply penalize people for improper consumption and immoderate consumption, but prevents it from happening in the first place, takes the alcohol away, reduces the opportunity to consume, you really can have an impact on these. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so driver was drinking. And by the way, was drinking well past the level of intoxication. In fact, twice the level of intoxication. Um, but so give me one, a couple other things. A bit hard when I went to the study, they saw that there was a, there was a, there was a problem with the, part of the infrastructure. There was no safety. The furniture there, where the car hits. And if you go back, now there is a safety furniture put in place there. Ah. So they were escaping from a hotel in Paris is an old city. They drove down into a tunnel under, I guess it was a river or something like that. And I'm sorry I don't have the photos of it, but the, 
the way the road was designed was such that there were these stone uh, pillars that were as close as I am to this table in the road. So it left very little room for error for that driver. Um, I can't, so one of the reasons motor vehicle crashes have gone down in the United States, the, one of the absolute major reasons is not because of driver training, it's because we change the roadways, right? So if you are driving on a major highway in the United States, you'll notice there's all this space between you and the next lanes and maybe even an entire field. So if you do lose control of your car for whatever reason, your car will spin out in the field. Even, for instance, the telephone poles or what are called breakaway telephone poles. When you hit them, instead of them stopping you and sending all the energy of the automobile into you as the occupant, they just break and slow you down. So roadway design really very much contributed uh, to the princess's death and the aspects. And apparently, I didn't know that they had refurbished that yeah, tunnel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that, that could have made a huge difference. Other thoughts? This What's that? This oh, this one. I may take a plunge here. I could be off track, but hey. Um, not having the information that my volunteer <laughs> can show, remember me. Yeah. Well, I don't because they were driving in Mercedes S five hundred. I don't know if it had anything to do with some of the safety features in the car. So I could. Be oh, I think that's a great question. It actually that is a great thing. It's not in this case okay. because it's pretty advanced. But I will add that the environment of the roadway in the U.S. has been very important. Equally important has been the shifts in the environment of the car. So, you know, in the old days, cars used to have all these things jutting out at you and the dashboard and the wheel was like straight up like this. These are major problems if you do actually get into a crash, even a low speed crash, um, that they're going to injure you. But I thought you were going to say something else about the Mercedes S500. I've never driven one, but. Uh, what's that? So it does have a nice crumple zone, exactly. That's what I mean, the environment of the car. So to absorb that that uh, energy in a crash is a very big deal. Well, in 1997, we didn't have all the um, expertise and the features that they have done since 2011 under the decade of option. So they are now making cars that are a little bit more um, breakaway friendly, like you just said. Yeah. Um, years ago, every time you hear about a crash in Guyana, you have this big Morris office for it. It's huge steel vehicle. Oh. Uh, whenever there's a crash, the driver would would um it would mostly the steering wheel would go into the person's chair. So oh. now they're making cars that whenever there's a crash, the engine falls off. So there's oh. no impact coming in. So in 1997, the Mercedes might not have had the safety features like now. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they they were still developing the safety features. And they might finalize it. And here I, I am stealing from, 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 from your presentation of what you said. Again, I could be way off track here. In terms, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember, in terms of the time it took them to get her from the crash site so I think that's to the hardware. Uh, so the intervention, and you said they were one hour, first hour is pretty close. So I'm thinking that we play So there. I think, so here's something interesting about France. So the emergency medical system, and I'm, I'm a foreign paramedic, so I spent a lot of time studying EMS and being in the field. In the US, in Canada, and even in the UK, we work to, to, to reduce what's called the time to night, the time to surgery. So from the moment you get injured to the time you can get to an operating room is critical and it can save your life. In France, what they still do, in fact, is try to bring the hospital to you as opposed to bring you to the hospital. So their ambulances are heavily equipped with all manner of different uh, things. Now, for, for major trauma and serious injury, that is almost certainly not going to help you. You need to get to a real surgeon in a real operating room in the hospital as quickly as possible. So it's very important. Now, for the princess, in fact, two cars back behind the princess was the physician who came on scene very soon, obviously after the crash, rushed to it, saw that this was the princess, et cetera, et cetera, and reported that she was lucid and talking after the crash. 
Um, it turns out that she had a pulmonary artery bleed from that crash. The pulmonary artery is a very low pressure vessel that bleeds very slowly. The ambulance came and took 45 minutes on scene, and it wasn't, it was almost two hours until the princess got to the operating room. If she had been there faster, the time to night could have absolutely saved her life because the surgeons could have gone in and tied off that bleeder in her in her lungs, and it would have been a lifesaver for her. So the, the surrounding emergency medical services system is very, very important here. Uh, in fact, it's led to, and this is interesting, if you do watch The Crown, you'll see this in there. Um, there was a lawsuit between the nations over this, over the loss of the princess, and that the French emergency medical services system had killed her, basically, although there are numerous other ones. Another question? She said, oh, no, it's okay. So I love it. And so both of you got that. Most people don't get that when I ask the five things. There is one last thing. I'm trying to get it with a fancy car. So what, what else was going on? Do you remember why they rushed out of the hotel? Paparazzi. Paparazzi, right. The media was chasing them. So now you have a driver who has consumed twice the level of intoxication, who's getting into a fancy, really fast automobile, right? And he's driving at an enormous rate of speed. I think it was 70, 80 miles an hour uh, in this very confined space, right? Uh, and so speed is a huge challenge. Um, number one people, the reason people get into a, a car crash is, does anyone know? Not speed. Reckless driving. Reckless driving. Inattentiveness. In distraction, in all forms. Whether texting and driving, alcohol, um, eating something while driving, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not here to chide you. I, I, I knew many of those things too, but not, not the alcohol, though. Never, never, never. Uh, or the texting. Um, but I will take a sip of coffee from time to time. And all this accumulates and is a distraction. So that's the number one people get into a crash. But the number one pe reason people die in a crash is because of high school. So the energy that it takes to, create, to generate that car and get it up to high speed, there's a big difference between 15 miles an hour and 65 miles an hour. All of that is an amount of energy that when you get into the crash, that energy has to go somewhere. And you want as little of that energy to come into your body as the occupant of the car as possible. So distraction is the reason people get into a crash, speed is the reason people die. So you're trying to reduce speed. So you got all five of those things uh, for Princess Diana. Uh, which sadly, um, there's a lot of a, a lot of continued discussion about that case. Um, and but it's a good way to learn and to think about what we could have changed, not just for motor vehicle crashes, but imagining what we could change for injury prevention overall. Can I have the next slide? If you lost my slide, that's fine. Um, okay, so. I want to talk more about, I, want, I really am going to focus on two things. And let's focus more, I think the, the Motor Vehicle Safety Council is going to enjoy this. But, uh, so I'm going to focus on motor vehicle crash safety. And then I do want to talk a little bit about um, suicide and then perhaps touch on what Dr. DeGudis was going to talk about the Haddon Matrix. Um, so the, these are density equalizing cartograms for, for the world. So the way these work, you can see the top of it's just the map of the world. The bottom one, is also a map of the world, but every country, every country is expanded based on how much population it has, right? So you can see how very large India is, for instance, in this map, in the yellow, got it. Uh, okay, or, or China. And you can see how large those countries are uh, because, can I get the next slide? Now, you also have a sense when you look at these density equalizing cartographs, the, how things are different. And in fact, how things flow in the world. So this is a comparison of wealth and poverty. You get more of a sense of where the wealth is and how different it is in, in the world in terms of poverty. That's one. Now, I want you to look at this too, because I think this is fascinating. You begin to think about um, different car cultures, where cars are emerging, who has large automobile fleets. And I'm trying to pick that Diana as much as I can. And who has very large road traffic deaths in the world? And you get a sense that there are differences here, right? So to the extent that there is a car culture, 
Sometimes it can be protective, but other times to the extent that you can get people out of cars entirely, there's advantage to that. Could be walking, could be um, taking public transportation. These are all opportunities to try to reduce motor vehicle crash step. And then, but I also want you to look at this. So the first one I was showing was uh, four plus wheeled vehicles. This is two plus wheeled vehicles. And you get a sense um, how these two maps actually look very, very similar. So when you have a culture where you, are, you need to drive for your family, for your work, for your school, but you're left with um, two wheeled uh, vehicles, well, the probability of death in a crash is 38 times the probability of death in a, an enclosed automobile. You can see the challenges that this uh, generates in terms of, of road deaths around the world. And you all can see that, right? These are very similar, the two maps. Next one. Now, here's a, a point I want to make, and I thought this would be interesting. I, I have given this before, um, particularly uh, in Southern Africa, but there's also this relationship between the pace of development, economic development, that is, and roads, road traffic deaths. I think it's important. If you, if you, you probably already recognize this very much so, but if you haven't thought this through, um, I think it's really, really important as roadways here develop, and perhaps I, I'm only just learning, so you have to correct me. It seems as if the roadways are on the cusp of major development here. Yeah. Um, so perhaps for um, the more experienced individuals in the room, perhaps when you were younger or children, the roadways were very, very different than they are right now. Um, I've noticed that there's a lot of congestion around Georgetown. Now I know I, I'm going to just be heretical in one, in one breath and tell you that, um, yes, I, I don't like congestion in roadways either, but it is a form of safety uh, promotion, <laughs> to be very honest with you. Why? people down. Now, uh, anyways, there are ways to, to allow increased speeds safely, but you have to be smart about that development. Um, uh, and smart development of that is really, really important. Okay, so I wanted to just give you some examples of a few countries and what happened in their development. So the first one is um, the German reunification between East and West Germany, right? And what you're going to see here is that while the West um, so the, look at the red and the blue line. So the red line is West Germany, and those are billions of kilometers traveled. Okay, and the unification is in 1989, I think, right? So you can see the moment of, of unification. And effectively, East Germany was a developing nation, right? So the roadways were very underdeveloped. But West Germany, the red line, there was no real, in fact, the amount people drove went down. But in East Germany, it skyrocketed uh, the amount people drove. And on the left side here is car occupant deaths. So that really what you're looking at is the growth in car occupant deaths after the roadways developed in East and West Germany. Next one. Now, so this is some interesting work that um, I and others at the University of Botswana and other universities, uh, in, uh, other scholars in Zambia and South Africa had done comparing the two countries, um, Botswana and Zambia in their roadway development. Now in the, I guess around 2000 is when the diamond industry in Botswana really began to expand. And, the similar thing did not happen in Zambia on the right. You can get a sense, this is in 2010, maybe 2015. So the Botswana um, had, um, there's a, it's an amazing culture where everyone has three homes, right? So um, folks will have their city home, yeah, where they worked primarily in Habarone. Um, they will have their cattle post because cattle are wealth. So you want to keep your cattle as, as much as possible healthy. So you would have that. And then you have your village home, probably where your family lives. Now, but Botswana is a massive nation. Very few people, not many more people than, um, uh, than Guyana. However, um, it is a massive land area. Uh, and so people will drive these extremely long distances. And they were so thrilled about the diamond money that they made these honest people perfectly straight roads for, you know, a thousand miles or something. It was whatever, hundreds and hundreds of miles 
where you could drive a very straight road from your cattle post to your home and back to the city. Um, they did this without any thought about controls for speed, controls for, in this case, animals that would come across the road and so forth. Uh, whereas in Zambia, again, people very much dislike having to drive on the road like this on the right, but it slowed them down. Uh, and next, next slide. And there was a huge shift in roadway traffic deaths between the two nations, right? So you get a sense of the growth in GDP uh, in Botswana in the blue on the left, whereas in Zambia, things stayed about the same. And then you can just see the, the ensuing major differences in roadway traffic deaths with that economic development between the two nations. Yes. Uh, maybe not that a year is 2006. And 2015, I think, is the dot one over there. Yes. So, uh, so in 2011 is when we had the decade of after. And every roadway, a new road that are building now, they, they're, 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 um, they're obligated to put in all the safety measures and the safety infrastructure and, and um, safety furniture on the roadways now. Right. So even though we're having developing roads, you might not see the development of more traffic or more deaths because now they're building the roads with all these safety furnitures that you have in the web. So it's hugely important. Tell me more about the, the, the this is from the WHO, right? Or is yes. it from the UN? I can't remember. The, which one? The, um, the decade of action. Yes. The decade of action. It was won for 10 years from 2011 and it ended in 2020. And then we have a new one that came out from the Stockholm report. And then that started in 2021, it's ending in 2030, and it's hoping that we will reduce deaths and injuries by 50% by the year 2030. That's brilliant. And I think that's hugely important to reduce the global burden, especially of road traffic. And it gave us the, the, the uh, foundation and the pillars of the strategy of how we can prepare for each country. So is Guyana embracing the world? Yes, okay. 100%. Um, okay. Before you move on to the slide, sure. Uh, um, do you have any information as to why you have the drop in Botswana from around 2002, 2000? Oh, that last little dip okay. down. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you, so we continue to take that. It actually goes back up. And I think to your point, um, I don't know that. I'm just going to make the connection. It goes back up to the point where the decade of action happens, and then it flattens. Now, I don't know. I haven't looked at it since like 2019. It may then start to go down. But to be fair, right, so they still never prepared for the economic development of those roadways. Um, I'll add one other thing, too. I'm going to come back to alcohol. One of the other challenges that the Batswana had was not simply the straight roads that permitted speed, when you would leave Amarone, um, those straight roads to get onto them, there was a sea of alcohol outlets um, to get people to purchase alcohol for those very long drives, which most often people would be driving by themselves. So that was another major challenge. And they did act, but it took over a decade to act to reduce the that alcohol availability at those entry roads. Follow up question. Okay. So you it was Botswana, the example of Botswana with yes. straight road. We read and hear about the Autobahn in Germany. Yes. Um, where you have the Autobahn where you're driving at horrendous speed. Yes. So what's the race in Germany? And is, a, is there a contradiction in, in the Botswana, between Botswana experience and what we hear about in the Autobahn? In Germany, using the autobahn. No, I think, you explain? I don't know the German experience, and we can look it up. I'll show you a way to look that up. Okay. Actually, at the end of compare, compare, compare countries. Um, my understanding is that road traffic crash deaths in Germany remain a chief problem. Well, just, okay. I, I don't think it's ever gone down uh, the way it did in the United States. Much of Northern Europe. So the U.S. did well, actually. So it's one of our. Uh, the leading public health achievements of the 20th century, to be very honest with you, is the reduction in road traffic deaths. So I don't know about Northern Europe. Yeah, um, I don't know. I, um, I wouldn't benefit from the exact education, but I think it's an important subject to study because we have very local 
I was wondering if any consideration was given to um, in, in, the, in the design of new rules to emerging and if that would be a difference in terms of what I'm um, for actual yeah. drivers like that, if there were any considerations to, and I said, because from local research that I that was done by the students of promise, actually found that many drivers have to have issues with the of traction area. That's cool vision. Mm -hmm. Not an issue with this, but they can have a good fix with the traction area. And so if that would ever consider a part of the and see if that might have considered the problem. Driver licensing and training kind of thing? Um, no, 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 and then I tell. So drivers, it should, oh, how can I tell? You know, to see, you know, you have this infraction is, infraction is to put that kind of thing. I, I think it's a, absolutely, and I think in the U.S. there, you, as part of driver licensing and training, you need to show your that you have you need to have proper vision as part of that for your first licensing. So, uh, and that will be on just about anyone's uh, driver license. So, but that, although it depends on the state, now, I do know you have this opportunity at the moment people come in to to drive for the first time. To teach them how to do that, you, and but I don't know what the driver licensing and training is like here. But I will tell you, there are many nations around the world where it's almost non-existent, uh, and that poses a poses a problem. Hey, can I comment on your uh, road, the uh, curves of the roadways for emergency vehicles? Um, so my family is from Greece, and um, the so in the U.S. we never drive on that part of the road. Um, and it's been always fascinating to me to go to, to where my family lives in the villages in, on the islands in Greece and see people drive there as a it's just simply another lane. <laughs> um, and the European Commission, the European Union actually has come down on Greece dramatically over that uh, because they're paying for the roads effectively, the nation is not. And they have forced that lane to not be driven on. Now, that it hasn't been eliminated, that kind of use of the lane. Uh, but it has those lanes have been created for emergency vehicles and they have been much better used and you can see in that nation the road traffic deaths have gone down partly because of that um, so I, I think that's a huge point that i'm glad you raised it because not many people think about that and that's all part of roadway design too the importance of roadway design i don't know that probably the decade of action includes something for emergency vehicles and that those lanes are only for emergency Okay, just to educate you, just to educate you. Yes, do. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned all the things about speeding alcohol, even the safety uh, measures on the road, um, feeding and so on. Um, there's another one for us. Now, you mentioned once there's development, you'll we'll see the increase in deaths, accidents, and so yes. All of those things are here. Um, probably Guyanese are driving in Greece or Greece <laughs> because we do the same thing, right? With minibuses, especially. But all of those things, feeding everything is here, especially development, but nothing is curbing the drinking, the cattle, the cattle on the road, everything. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yes. we have cattle on the road. And it has yeah. killed people, and nobody does anything here. So there are no there are no controls. So that was one of the great successes in Botswana too was the controls. You can design roadways so the cattle can't get on the roadway, and it's not that expensive to do it. Um, and so the motivation there was yes, the motor vehicle crashes, but as I said, motivation was also loss of cattle, which was loss of money. Uh, so are we allowed, that's fascinating. Thank you. Are we allow people to ride motorcycles without helmets? I know. Uh, I, could, <laughs> I could teach a whole other thing on the value of motorcycle helmets. If you take a plastic cup and put it in your head, yeah, yeah, right. you're okay. You're okay. That, that's okay by the police. Well, motorcycle helmets are, by the way, they work. There's just no doubt about it. They will save your life, right? That's true. Um, so, and they're infinitely, motorcycle helmet laws are infinitely enforceable. I mean, it's very difficult to pass a seatbelt law and enforce it to see inside people's cars, right? The double. But if you're a motorcycle rider not wearing a helmet, um, you can easily be picked up by police uh, for not doing so. So, so once a helmet law gets passed in many nations, um, 
it it works to save lives. So I would have there. Absolutely. You have it on the law. People just don't do it. Well, then you need to have magic enforcement. That's on that law. That's a problem. I will tell you, you know, uh, sadly, despite all our efforts, most U.S. states do not have a motorcycle on the law. So you are ahead of us in that. And our motorcycle riders are dying at, at record rates right now in the United States. So pick up his confidence. Yes. And for me, uh, an area for research is bricks. Yes. All right? Because I've seen, uh, many of us would have seen people both like this. Using uh cyclist helmet. Oh, I see what you're saying. My class. And riding in front of policemen, traffic police wardens, and nothing is done. And so it'd be interesting to know people's knowledge of the law and then their attitudes and practices with regard that not only for the cyclists, but now. The, the, the law enforcement agency because people do crazy things on the road every day. And most of the coming into Georgetown in the mornings, all of the roadways have traffic police. Meaning the person standing directing traffic. Yes, directing traffic. And all of these things happen in front of them. Yeah, and, and nothing actually, actually happens. So the, that's what you have for research also. You should join the research, research center. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking the same policeman he's talking about at the traffic light will see two guys without motorcycle helmets and they'll charge you because you're on your cell phone in the car. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's worthy of it's worthy a research question. <laughs> So you could, with just a little bit of research, you could begin to understand this and make recommendations about solutions. Yes, so this gentleman was having a question. there are new relationships with driving a used car or a new car, because a lot of times when they have factory defective cars, uh, like in America, when they withdraw these cars from the and then they pass it to the third world country, right? Yes, and driving because we don't need to get a system and you get a, a, a faulty system, you end up while you're a safe driver, you end up in a crash. Yeah, absolutely. So the fleet gets moved country to country, and by the way, it's all, every new car uh, line that gets introduced each year has all the latest safety features. Many of which uh, can save your life in the crash. But if it's a car from 10 years ago, it might be absent those. I always, I, I, I don't know uh, how many folks of Indian origin are here, but I always talk about the, I'm trying to remember, the Tata? Yeah, Tata. Right here. Huh? Are there Tatas here? Yeah. Okay. So the Tata is a very challenging automobile. <laughs> uh, in, in, in terms of getting around, but also in terms of its safety features. And that was something that the world community, the world traffic safety community, got behind and was forcing that. From, I don't even know if that company's still in, in existence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah but that's, so, so things like that. So the way the car is designed, someone else was raising that before, the design of the automobile, the environment of the automobile can save your life. It's very, very important. So older, less well-designed cars are a challenge. Uh, but it's not Did just you have a question behind you? Do you have a question? Yeah. So, I love it. Okay. So first things first, police officers go for something in specific that like he said. So if he's not looking for a motorcycle, that's what's going wrong. He looks for a bus driver, probably overload or something. That motorcycle can cost an accident, right? How would how do you plan on improving guy and all? In, the, in, in terms of that, in, in terms of the relationship, well, I don't plan on personally. Uh, I love a very difficult question. So you stumped me. Um, but can I just say, I, I think I love the fact that you're asking the question and that you, you look to me like you're the next generation that's going to make this change. Yeah, right? yeah. So I want you, you know, to continue asking really difficult questions like that. <laughs> Please do, don't forget that, right? Um, and so we're hoping maybe to learn more about this so that we can learn what are the best choices. You know, we've talked about many, many choices. 
any country, any any community can't implement them all at once. So you're going to have to pick and choose what are the first options here, whether we're talking about traffic safety or suicide prevention, um, and then carry them forward. Some of these are going to take quite some time, and they're going to need this generation, but then your generation, the generation after that, and so forth, to really carry this forward. Um, maybe I can make a little suggestion to her. <laughs> so. Um, because I, I have been a policy maker as well as implementation, a lot of times it is after that we've actually made policy decisions without evidence based on people's full got anecdotal. Um, you observe something and for you it is something that you think, well, this is what is happening. So what I would say, one, again, let us research in this thing. If, and once the evidence points to that, and, and there are different ways of researching that, then we take it to the policy makers to say, well, so this, these are police officers. And if, if, if policemen say, for example, yeah, 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 anonymously, we are more interested in where we can make uh, dollar, right? And so therefore, there's something that we then take to the administration to say, well, you need to look at changing your training for the, 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 the folks who are out there. And uh, then we say, well, okay, look, will training be the answer? And we put that training into effect and see sometime out, did it, did it help us to achieve the results that we were looking for? We can, we, we can apply a number of different things and see whether or not they did make an impact. If they didn't, then we go down the wrong tree. Or if they have, then you continue. So that's one of the ways of addressing. Oh, sorry, in the interest of moving the other doctor. 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 Tell you that the, the science around, for instance, red light running cameras. So if you drive drive, drive through a red light, uh, there's a, it takes a photo of your license plate and sends you a you know about this way. The science around that is that it's incredibly successful, right? So red light running gets reduced all, almost overnight in those. We'll stop there. We'll stop. Stop anywhere. We put a camera right where all the street when they don't stop anymore. Stop. The issue here with the motorcyclists riding without helmets and doing other other offenses, you know. So yes, it, it, it's gonna something's gonna work, right? But we, again, areas for research, let's do the research and see what happens. Absolutely. Absolutely. Going back to the original talk about injury and crime. Yes. Which I think we ran off of the curve. I think as I agree with you in cultural change because you can keep blaming, speeding, alcohol, this, that, that. But it's all up to us. Because when you go now to vehicles, they're all coming from Japan. They would never pass American standards in high safety. So that's another problem. So we keep blaming, and it's all about us. The driver, the but right. To the extent you can make a change that is, yes, that is. So I hear the word culture, and perhaps there is some norming to occur culturally over, over a period. Those are very challenging um, falls to move down the field. A structural change, like changing the, the ability of cars that are not up to some standard from even entering the nation, 
um, putting red light running times, changing the, the roadway with roundabouts, for instance, things that reduce speed no matter what. You can't drive fast. These sorts of things um, have great value and they may seem like they cost a lot of money for the policymakers in the room. But the return on investment on these is actually quite high given how successful they can be. Can I pivot? Because I keep getting reminded we have about 15, 20 minutes. So I, I want to talk about the other thing I said I wanted to talk about was suicide and suicide rates. Were there any questions online? Oh, sorry. Okay. So, you know, within the 5 million injury deaths happen globally every year which by the way are more than the deaths from HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. Okay, so this is significant. About a million of the five are suicides. And you, we've been giving you the, or you've seen all the numbers for Guyana as one of the top five nations in the world in this case. Um, so can you go to the next slide? I, I wanted to, this is taken from, um, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. Have any of you seen this, this, this visual online anywhere? Okay, so you can get this for every country. So this is Guyana. I wish I could see what the top of Oh, I can read it here, good. So this is all deaths in Guyana of all ages, uh, all genders. And you get a sense, the red is infectious diseases, uh, like HIV and things of that nature. The, the uh, blue are chronic diseases, and the green are your injuries, okay? So it's a substantial chunk of green in the nation, and you can even see within the green what is dominating that. Really, self-harm, okay, or suicide, violence. I, I'm not going to present violence in this talk, but I'd like to learn more about that issue in the country. Uh, and then the road injury. Now, when I started talking about this, I said, Injury and the disease of injury is something that is mostly the young. So go to the next slide, please. So this now is Guyana uh, for 15 to 49 year olds. Okay, so roughly the first half of the human lifespan. And by the way, it's also restricted to men, to males. Now I want you to get a sense of what's going on here. The, of course, chronic disease and infectious disease is a challenge, but the dominant challenge here are injuries, okay? Self-harm, violence, and road injuries. So just to give you a sense of, of the burden of injury in the nation that is especially affecting uh, young people uh, and, and males in the nation. Now, I'm going to come back to Greece. I told you my family is from Greece. And I've been there to study suicide many times. And I don't know if you all remember the challenge that the nation had in terms of all the austerity, uh, uh, economic austerity policies that they imposed on the country. Um, and we had a chance to look at all the suicides in the nation. And I'm, I point this out just to show you the change over time. Oh, this is from uh, 1983 to 2013 for all the suicides. And there's a significant difference. And I, and it's, Undoubtedly the same. I haven't looked for Guyana between men and women here. Um, but that would be a worthwhile, rich question actually to pursue as a simple, straightforward question. Okay, so men are higher. Can you go to the next one? Yeah. Now, we also looked at those economic, the implementation of those economic austerity measures. I want to point out a couple of things. So this is the same period, 1983 to 2013. At the top, you see all suicides. June 2011 was a moment when they had the most, the greatest challenge of imposing those economic austerity measures. And they went from something like a 6% unemployment rate to a 46% unemployment rate in the span of less than a year. You can see how the suicide rate in the nation, press, press it one more time. So you can see how in the top of the suicide rate jump and stay high, okay? After that 2011, can you press it again? Now, I want to point that out is that there are, I know we're always thinking about, uh, of course, different things and different opportunities for suicide prevention, whether it be mental health system, pesticide, and so forth, which are very, very important. But I also want to point out that the underlying economic structure of a nation can very much affect its suicide rate. And, I, and that is an opportunity for prevention. People don't imagine that it is, but it certainly is. This other arrow, 
is the moment when the Greeks hosted or right around the time when they were getting ready to host the Olympics. Okay, when there was economic prosperity, not austerity. And you can see how the suicide rate actually went down. So this goes in both directions. Okay. Um, press it one more time for me. Now, the other point I will show is this moment in April 2012. There was a talk today about the worker effect. So there was a sudden increase in suicide in the nation because this person, a man committed suicide very publicly in the city center. And he, which is an absolutely terrible event, okay? But the news agencies covered it. So the Greek news agencies, I'm, I'm showing you the New York Times here, covered it in great detail. That sort of irresponsible journalism actually led to higher suicide rate for the nation. So we have to take great care. And there's another opportunity, perhaps that doesn't occur here, I don't know with the media, but so there, there are rules now among journalists how to cover suicide. Um, and it's very important that it be done uh, uh, in, a, in a good way. The last thing I will show you is the Greeks. Um, this is all the suicides plus what I call potentially misclassified suicides. We touched on this a little, I think, in another session for Guyana in Greece. It is an Orthodox Christian nation. The origins of Christianity are there. It is the most proper and stringent Christianity in the world. Um, it is worse than illegal to commit suicide. Your entire family is excommunicated from the church if you do. So what that does is it drives coroners and medical examiners when a suicide happens to not label it a suicide. And perhaps uh, 20 to 30% of Greek suicides are labeled as accidents and not suicides. So I'm, I'm also pointing that out as a data collection challenge where we really could have uh, opportunities. I don't know if that challenge is here as well. But suicide, of course, is a very uh, difficult and temperamental event for a family, and people don't want to talk about it, and that leads to data errors, which can make it challenging for them. Any questions? Yeah, oh. quick, quick, I have more one more technical question. Yeah, because you're an epidemiologist. Um, you said that the public suicide yes. led to an increase in suicide. How confident are you that that was not an association? Because you 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 use causation there. Do you have other information that you have presented to us? For example, did you interview or, or were the interviews conducted yeah. with family members of those who have committed suicide after that event for for for, for your conclusions? Yes. No. I think it's a perfect question. So there were some post-event ground truthing of the suicides that occurred in the days to weeks after that event. Mm -hmm. And the coroners recorded that the people were responding to this event in Santagna Square. Oh, okay. The other thing is, is that the way these statistical models work, they are time interrupted statistical models. They take into account everything that happened in the, I don't know, the decades ahead and it's marching along. And then on a single day, something happens and there's that much of an increase. Um, we think that it's outside statistical chance and it's, I don't know what else to attribute it to other than that, that event. Nothing else happened on that day. And then it's literally the day after uh, there was a rash of these events. You know, so. but, uh, but can I just say your question is fantastic. And those are the kinds of things, right? So you, you should be anything, anyone tells you of something like this, you should be challenging and asking hard questions. Like that. Well, two things then, how the virtual did training for the media because of this kind of thing. And then also the British High Commission last last year also did a, a similar training. But to come back to um, Dr. Edward's you know, question, in Barometer, there, one, there was one suicide. In the same week, there were three others. And when they went back to one of them on, on, the, on, the, on her social media, she had written, oh, this person got a lot of fame by killing Myself, and therefore I'm, I'm also going to get the same thing. Okay. So <clears throat> I think it's established that, uh, that there's this copycat syndrome. Yeah, we did. I, so I did get to meet many of the coroners and medical examiners across the nation. We had these conversations directly with them. In So many of them did what are called psychological autopsies after these events to determine all those little details. It's not perfect. I'm not going to tell you it's perfect, but, but we think it's very much possible. Okay, final question. Go ahead. 
with the current the coroner's misclassified. Yes. And I, I, I draw a parallel with us and the HIV in Guyana. Oh, yeah. All right. We're to prevent the stigmatization. We, for example, as physician and, and being in, in charge of this program, I would write um, immune suppression as the cause of death rather than HIV. Yeah, yeah. So, so armed with that information, has there been any corrective action with the coroners? Sorry, I'm <laughs> Oh, no. There have been many attempts. attempts at it. Yeah. The church is very powerful uh, okay. in our nation. And it's been very difficult to, to change that discussion. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, at least we have a sense of the magnitude of the misclassification, which has been very helpful for, for studies in the nation going forward. And there continue to be attempts to change that, oh. the misclassification at the, at the level of the death certificate. Okay, so what I do want to say about this is we did this study, the Greeks were in the midst of very bad austerity. So, you know, Northern Europe was unrelenting. They were going to consider putting this austerity measures. This study and one or two others made it into the popular press across Europe and actually influenced um, some of the decisions about austerity and marching back with rating of the banking and other sorts of things in the nation. Um, and ultimately, um, moving it back. So you can see all the coverage we got, which we never intended. We really just put this out there in the British Medical Journal and people just picked up on it. And it actually did make it into policymaker stance. I, I give you this, not to tell you that we will never put research, but to just tell you that publication of this sort of research globally or even locally in the nation if the media can get a hold of it and then champion the message forward, it actually can change policy. So there's great value here uh, to doing this. So it's not just research for its own sake. Okay, next. Okay, so here's just my sort of musings on suicide prevention opportunities potentially in Guyana. I, I am floored by the new suicide prevention law. I think it is a tremendous way forward um, to decriminalize suicide in the nation. Um, it's unbelievable. It's just wonderful to see that happen. And I think there's going to be a lot of benefit to that. I don't know for sure. So I'm suggesting that perhaps a future study here would be simply to study the implementation of the law. Uh, I would love to see someone uh, take that on to see if the law itself actually had some, uh, some value to suicide in the nation. And then the other thing I think about are the three M's um, that, that I think have value here is, you know, improvement in mental health services. It's incredibly important. I heard folks talking about uh, community, the importance of community health workers and midwives, uh, perhaps in more rural areas uh, where people don't have as much connectedness. I can't, that has been shown not for suicide, but for many other health uh, challenges, uh, the use of community health workers, because you can train many of them. Um, the other is means restriction. I, I, I can't talk enough about the value of that. I think there's good evidence from other countries like India about the means restriction around pesticides and the value that could have. But it needs to be more than just training, I think, about not about pesticides and protecting. There needs to be better policy and controls on the distribution of these from the, from the beginning. And then the last thing, and I'm, I'm harkening back to the Greek experience, uh, most people don't think about it, but money matters here, right? Yeah. So, uh, and they don't think about it as an opportunity for suicide prevention, but it really, really is. And I don't know what the exact program is, the employment program or uh, some other sort of uh, financial support program or something like that. But I wouldn't undersell the, the possibility of it having an effect on suicide as well. And also worthy of study. Um, next slide, I think that's it. Oh yeah, I'm not gonna go into that. We're over time. So you can go back one and we can reflect on that. And thanks, so everyone wants to talk more. Can I make a quick uh, comment on the means restriction? Here, um, it's only restricted to those farmers who need that to control uh, pests and uh, weeds and things like okay. that. But um, I think in one of the um, uh, sessions or one of the overseas uh, presented, they actually did say that in the countries where they were abused, they actually gave the pesticides only to cooperatives. And that oh. when you are going to need, when you are going to use it, it's given to you to use for that day, and that is not pesticide that you buy and keep. That's brilliant. So maybe that's that's why they it's just keep. enough to get you for your exactly that not that, more than... that you cannot keep that that you have easy access that's to. Brilliant. So maybe that's something that we may have to think about uh, going forward. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
we used to have a system here where, um, or, or, or we still do, just like it's not a boss, whereby um, it has to be where it's kept. We'll have to have two keys. You have one, I have one. So you have to open it, I have to open before before both of us can have access. But once you kick to the farmers, they have both keys with one person. So it's the same thing. So we have to come across, you know, come up with a means of um, getting around that. I like the first idea. I think it, I, I always try to think about what we call passive interventions. These structural interventions that don't require people to remember to do something right. or to change their behavior. It's not that I wouldn't pursue those, but, but these sorts of passive interventions that don't ask you to do anything, like giving them just enough, because you know they're going to use it for their crops to keep their business alive, and then there will be no pesticide left, that sort of thing. I think that's very smart. Sorry, just for a moment, just like thank Dr. Brandt, Professor Brandt, for the talk. Um, no, we're, not, we're not finished. I just want the uh, online show that we have roughly about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. So only two minutes if anyone online has um, a question. Yeah, they can enter in the chat. To follow up on Dr. Adam Pros and your um, comments on means restriction. Yeah. And I, I was going to ask the question in another way. In terms of experiences of other countries, where down that route where the practice is um, where you have lots of small scale farmers and kitchen guys. Okay, so for example, I can go to major um, chemical retailers in Georgetown. I'm planting the kitchen garden right now. And if I need to have, I, I go to them and say, well, you know, I'm planting um, spinach, which is called in, in our terminology. And I see some, some holes in the leaves. I can go to any of those yeah. and they're going, to, they're going to give me something. So I like Dr. Arnold's point in terms of looking at exa uh, experience of other countries whereby um, just making it available on the day that you're going to use it works, maybe work well for the large scale farmers like our rice farmers who have a couple of acres or some other things like that, but the kitchen garden. So, Maybe the means restriction in terms of the 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 retailing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I can't say I know what our pesticides and, and control the, 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 the regulations with regards to that and in terms of how much and restrictions in terms of the retailing of those. But well, that's something that we need to consider. Yeah, because almost anybody can go and purchase those things. And, I, and so let's look at the low hanging fruits. Actually, and, um, I actually wonder if there are alternatives to having pet for like home use, uh, horticultural alternatives that aren't uh, toxic per se, but still achieve the same thing. I don't, I don't know. Additionally, I I can go from um, purchase rodenticides, right? Yeah, I have rodenticides. Else, anybody could go. You you have people in uh, the streets that are in uh, rock poison. Yeah, we all know about that, right? And some people put the ingest those things that. Well, I think, let me just, I'm going to argue back just a little bit. Uh -huh. I'll give you from the U.S. standpoint. Okay. Because our biggest source of means that we need to restrict for suicide are firearms. And um, there's constant arguments um, to not restrict those means because there's all sorts of alternatives to those means. And the, it, it's what, what's called a substitution effect. So restricting that particular mean, people are just going to pick something out again. And it's not perfect, right? And they do pick other things. But on average, we know that, for instance, means restrictions of firearms in the U.S. are successful in reducing the suicide rates um, from firearms. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the suicide rate from some other mean goes up. So there are ways to do this that don't necessarily uh, uh, create substitution of that. But, but you have to be creative and it's going to take research and a lot of uh, thoughtful uh, uh, research. Sat down, any more questions? I think I'm still on the uh, means restriction. One of the ways that um, I think we need to look at uh, where we have the lockbox with 
two keys. Um, it obviously it was abused because it was found that one person will have both keys, or both keys are put on the table and anybody could go you know, for them. I think whenever there is a, a case of suicide coming from those areas, we never investigate. So people people are aware that, oh, well, if even if I don't um, uh, go with the two keys, because you have to have the two keys before you are given the large scale uh, in the confinement. And so because there's no follow up, um, people continue to abuse it. So I think even if we are going to continue to have the two key system, lockbox system, we must have some follow up to see what happened? How did it fail? Why did it fail? What do we do differently? Do we hope some? Do we hold somebody culpable? All that time, you know, needs to be looked at. Lockbox is fascinating, okay. and um, I'll, I'll tell you. So, for uh, firearms and children's medicine, actually, there's been a number of good studies on this. And I, again, this isn't about eliminating the problem. Right. But but lockboxes, many people will. Uh, even if they have the key, they will leave the box open to keep because they don't want they don't want to go to the trouble of locking and unlocking it. So there has been success with lock boxes and cabinets, for instance, that automatically close. Right. So that and again, it's not eliminating the problem, but it's saying that um, for, for the person who wants to leave it open because it just makes it easier for them, they're going to have to have the key and it will close on its own. And so someone walking by will not have access in, in that moment. And, and we haven't talked about the impulsivity of suicide either. And that's, that's an important, important thing to understand is the risk of suicide is a very short-term risk for people. People come in and out, out of risky periods. So even if you can make a change at particular times, at particular moments, you can have success in terror. But that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. And I do think we should, I, I would recommend focusing on the means to the extent that but it's going to take creativity and thoughtfulness about, you know, you don't want to, we, in the U.S., for instance, we've had um, gun locks as a means restriction. So you can put a lock in the trigger. And uh, we still, to this day, and it drives me crazy because we still give them out at, at public health events. And we know that people just take them home and I don't know, lock their bicycle with it or, or <laughs> something else, right? So it's very often not used uh, for its intended purpose. So we, you have to be thoughtful about these means restriction strategies and not uh, not delude yourself into thinking that it works if it doesn't. So it's more important. Well, can I ask um, one quick question? And it's about screening. We, in this country, for several years, we've talked about screening. Do we have a, a five point scale screening that could be used by community health workers, by midwives, yeah. by ordinary? That's, that may be applicable to our population. And then um, we always talk about it, but nothing has been done about it. So, my question is do you know of any screening tools uh, uh, that could be used for, for places you know, such as ours? I mean, if, even if we have to test them again and see whether they are, whether they, whether the uh, uh, whether the tool is applicable, I, you know, I, I that's best to ask one of the psychiatric professionals what they know. But I will tell you that those screening tools have gotten better and better, mostly because they've become simpler. The complexity of the screening really detracts from its implementation. And, and again, when I say community health workers, I mean well-trained people, but that you can train in a relatively short period of time, and that allows you to train many, many of them. Because the, the goal here is simple screenings, many community health workers begin to touch as many other people as possible uh, in, in scenarios. And by the way, there's value. We, the, the UK just created a minister of loneliness. Does anyone have any? <laughs> no, it's very serious. It's a minister of loneliness. Um, and so I, I think many of these challenges for suicide come because folks are disconnected with other people and have no network around them. So to the extent that you can get not just community health workers to provide the screenings, but to provide someone to have it to, to interact with, I think is quite valuable. You might have it's more than I do. <laughs> but it's good to know about the uh, loneliness uh, uh, minister. About four years ago, Guyana scored 86% on um, happiness scale, oh, yeah. global happiness scale. And I thought maybe, uh, suicide were going to decrease them. 
Uh, just to comment on the question about screening. So I think I guess we'll talk after I am a psychiatrist. And um, the general scale that we use where I am um, the CFSRS of the Columbia um, suicide severity rating scale and six question scale, which is actually a shorter scale that's three questions and based on whether you answer yes or no is the first three. Then expand to scale six is very connected to the and it's, it's invalidated in multiple places. In com in, in populations in the, such as ours? Yeah. Okay. I am uh, in the 90s as well. I have been uh, in Banning while well, I was born here. Um, and I do research in suicide prevention medicine and research in the third place. are actually working with the and it's sort of very similar cultures in weird ways. Um, in the time that I've been there, and we're doing work there using that scale. Wish to follow up, uh, Dr. Arnold is and some wish to follow up there. So, one, we hear that there is the tool, six questions that is available that can be useful in populations like ours. My experience as a physician in this country. And trying also to see the implementation of a number of new initiatives has been the reluctance of the target audience to implement those things. So, again, for research purposes, right, uh, we can look at the collaboration of the acceptability and willingness of the target population yeah. to use the tools. I have a suspicion. Uh, that's my hypothesis that basically is the unwillingness of people to use the tool, yeah, and not necessarily the applicability. I, I think the willingness to use plays a, plays a greater role because, they, for example, prior to COVID, there was the um, severe acute respiratory um, illness surveillance, yeah. which would have helped us in terms of screening people for respiratory illnesses and so on. And we, we got support from WHO and tried far and wide to introduce that at our major hospital in the emergency room where a lot of people come for a respiratory illnesses. And up to this day, hasn't been implemented. And then we look and see at in other Caribbean countries, in the US and we echo, you know, they're able to shoot all because they're screening for these things and they're testing to know what's the what, what they're doing. So part of your comment, and so my experience in trying to work with primary care physicians, for instance, and trying to get something into their, or even emergency physicians, and get something into their patient encounter. You know, so I, I sort of stopped doing that because I'm one of 40 different screen tools and you're asking these folks who in the US it's a 13 minute encounter on average with the patient and now you're taking seven of their 13 minutes with uh, a checklist that grows ever longer so we do have to take care about uh, the burden so I don't think that they're 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 not it's not that they're not interested it's just that there's so many things that have now entered into the series of check boxes um, there's no time left to even have build a rapport and learn about your patient uh, at the end of all that. So we have to take care of what we put into that. That's why our main point of any of these tools is they have to be straightforward and sharp. Can I just make one comment? You were saying you said several times you can say implementation, implementation. I think this is a big part of it. It's implementation time. And it, it hits at all the things yeah. you're talking about, capability, accessibility. You're doing focus groups. You're doing all those types of things to understand what are the barriers? Why aren't they using it? And that's why I like implementation science, and that's sort of when you're introducing a new tool, you to understand are they going to use it? What it turns to them? I think it can start from that level instead of just saying, here is this thing, please do it without any sort of consideration as to how it affects their work. I think that that's important. And we are, um, we are very close to time, or one minute from time. Uh, so I'd like to thank you very, very much. You're very stimulating talk. Any final No, just thank you all for playing the block. Really fun to talk with you all.